lacrosse teams are Big Ten regular season champs, and one of them is undefeated heading into the conference tourney. Maryland baseball has the second most wins in the country, and which Terps will be taken in this week's NFL Draft? All that and more coming up on the Left Bench TV. I think this season, I'd say all the time, is such a journey. The Left Bench TV starts now. Hello and welcome back to The Left Bench TV, your sideline source for all things Maryland sports. I'm Stephen Mayo. And I'm Alana Mutnick. This spring sports season has been a historic one for the Maryland Athletics. And with only two shows left this semester, we've got a lot to go over. Stephen, no season has been more historic than spring than the last of Maryland's men's lacrosse. Yeah, that's right, Alana. And they kept it going in grand fashion against their biggest rivals this weekend. Now, whether Maryland has been avenging its national championship loss against Virginia, dominating a top five Rutgers squad at home, or just setting records week after week, it's been quite a memorable season thus far. On Saturday, the Terps look to continue their success in lacrosse's oldest rivalry, and they beat Johns Hopkins in blowout fashion. Maryland wasted no time getting on the board, scoring six goals in the first quarter alone, and keeping the Blue Jays down 12 to four at the half. Goalie Logan McNaney and his defense kept Hopkins scoreless for the entire third quarter as the offense went to work, building a 22-4 lead. Maryland's all-time leading point scorer Logan Wisnowskis notched his 300th career point and led the way with five goals and three assists on the night. Hopkins transfer Owen Murphy scored a career-high four goals in his return to Homewood Field. And Murphy was the one to run the rivalry trophy to the Terps at the end after the Hard Shells took down their biggest rival 22-7. The plus 15 scoring margin is the largest in all 116 installments of the rivalry. Here's Coach Tillman and Eric Molliver after the win. Started fast last year and did not finish, so we were really on the guys to stay focused. You know, we knew they would make a push or a run. Their leadership is so amazing. Like, they won't let us get distracted. Um, I mean, we prepare so hard all week, and... You know, we win games, but it's the next game always. We don't look like after this, it's the next week. Now two of the program's recent stars, Jared Bernhardt and Matt Rambo, have taken home the coveted Tawaraton Award, given to the nation's best all-around player. Now three of the Hard Shell's current players have been named nominees, and they come as no surprise. Leading the pack is Logan Wisnowskis, who has 70 points on 40 goals and 30 assists so far this season. Now next up is face-off specialist Luke Weirman, who owns the nation's second best face-off rate. He's been an absolute menace this season. Weirman has won 206 of his face-offs and notched eight goals this season. Maryland's defense is undoubtedly strong and it's led by senior Brett Makar, the third Terp nominated for the lacrosse's most prestigious award. Makar continues to be one of the best long poles in the country and has helped hold opponents to just over nine goals per game. Now, while Maryland's goalie is not on that list, but he certainly could be. Logan McNaney has shined between the pipes this season, and his performance on Saturday was no exception. The junior provided a defensive spark for the Terps, helping them to the lopsided 22-7 win. TLB's Kevin McNulty has more. With Maryland men's lacrosse averaging close to 19 goals per game, perhaps lost in the hype of its undefeated season, is the play of the team specialists. Guys like Luke Weirman and goalie Logan McNaney. And during the Terps 22-7 rout of Johns Hopkins on Saturday, McNaney was on his game. The junior and his defense didn't allow a full-strength goal until three minutes into the second quarter. We knew that um, we had to start off strong and keep the same pace throughout the whole game. And I want to give my props to the defense too. They, I mean, they did a great job of giving me shots that I could see all day. McNaney had 11 saves on Saturday, marking the sixth time this season that the goalie has had double-digit saves. And he did so in just three quarters, as he was pulled in favor of Drew Morris when the game was on ice in the fourth. And Morris picked up right where McNaney left off. He made a career-high seven saves in the fourth quarter alone. 
leading to nothing but respect from the starter after the game. He's one of the hardest workers we have on our team, and he goes out there and makes a lot of saves, very quality saves, and we all love it. We oh. all love to see that. McNaney's work in net combined with Weirman's prowess at the faceoff X bred a nightmare scenario for the Blue Jays, and NCAA tournament teams may be next. Logan did a great job of making saves. You get 10 in the first half, so you're on a 20-game pace, and then Luke is winning faceoffs. So you're slanting the field and getting lots of possessions. You're getting into a flow. Um, the guys are feeling comfortable. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Kevin McNulty. Yeah, and McNaney is one of the best at Maryland, if not the entire nation, and I'm just excited to see what he does for the rest of the season. And I still remember last season when he had that 60-yard goal. That was what everybody was talking about for those next three weeks following in the state. But you know what? Maryland must have a thing for goalies because Emily Sterling has been doing one heck of a job for women's lacrosse. She has. And if this weekend proved anything, it's that Maryland truly is the lacrosse capital of the world. The eighth ranked women's team impressed on Saturday by taking home yet another Big Ten regular season title. Pulling ahead right away and holding the lead for the rest of the game, the Terps took down number two Northwestern 15 to nine. Maryland's offense was stellar with seven different Terps finding the back of the net. But it was junior attacker Libby May who stole the show, netting a career high seven goals. Junior goalie Emily Sterling also notched a career high with 16 saves on Northwestern's 38 shots. The Terps will close out their regular season against number 19 Michigan in Ann Arbor this Saturday and begin the Big Ten tournament on May 6th at Rutgers. Here's Coach Kathy Reese after the win. You know, we took on a, a really talented Northwestern team who has had a great season um, this far as well. And, and I thought our team came out and played really well on the defensive end. Um, we're smart on our offensive possessions and just overall um, executed our game plan to a T. It was great. I'm just so proud. I want them to believe in themselves. And I think this season, I'd say all the time, is such a journey, right? Like there's ups and downs and we're learning and we're growing. And we've gone through so much. And, you know, come out and execute and, and play fearless. I'm something I'm just really proud of. And the accolades don't stop there for this team. Three Terps have been named to the Women's Tawaratan Award nominee list. Attacker Aurora Accordingly, defender Abby Bosco, and goalie Emily Sterling all got the nod. Accordingly currently sits third in the nation in points per game, averaging just over six. She's led the offense to 12 15-plus goal games this year. Bosco has led Maryland's defenders to hold opposing offenses under eight goals per game this season, and 12 of their 15 opponents have been kept below 10 goals. And Sterling leads the nation with a .54 save percentage. That women's lacrosse team that Kathy Reese has coached for so long now, but still continues to churn out these really good winning seasons. Men's lacrosse does the same with John Tillman, but you know what? All the spring sports have really been on this season in College Park. Yeah, they, they really have. It was also a winning weekend for your Dirty Terps. They traveled to Champaign to face off against Illinois, but they were on the wrong end of a beatdown in the first game of the series, dropping that one 19-1. But Maryland said we're not going back home with a series loss. In their doubleheader on Saturday, the Terps grabbed a 13-9 win in the first game and in the second game. It was none other than first baseman Maxwell Costas who kicked it off for the Terps, slamming one out of the park in the top of the second to get to the Terps on the board. After scoring three runs in the third inning, here's Matt Shaw in the fifth with an RBI single that brought Chris Aline home to break the tie and put Maryland up 5-4. to four. The Terps' defense was hot after that one. Illinois' Cam McDonald grounded into a double play for the last out in the bottom of the frame, and the Terps were full of energy. Although it was a Saturday, it was still Savvy's day. He tossed eight innings and fanned nine batters along the way. Here he is after the last strikeout when the Terps led six to four. What a moment. Then came Troy Schreffler Jr. singling to the left field, allowing Nick LaRusso to come home with the last run and clinching the series victory with a seven to four win. Wow, what a series for the Dirty Terps. And their 32 wins are currently the second most of any team in the nation. So our Nathan Schwartz is here to break down what's been contributing to their best season in program history to this point. Nathan? Yeah, guys, the Dirty Terps have put the entire country on notice with how well they've performed this year. And there are three players in particular that have had a tremendous impact on this team. Maryland's starting spot at third base was a major question mark following the departure of Tommy Gardner. But Coach Rob Vaughn found the answer in the transfer portal, and his name? is Nick LaRusso. LaRusso has arguably been Maryland's MVP this year, 
as the junior transfer from Villanova has done nothing but exceed expectations in his first season as a Terp. Through 40 games, LaRusso is hitting 321 with seven homers and 38 RBIs. In 17 of those 40 games, LaRusso has had multiple hits, which is good for second on the team behind Luke Schliger. LaRusso has also been stellar defensively, currently with a 954 fielding percentage. And while the two-way player hasn't appeared on the mound since March 26th, he could get some innings down the road as the regular season winds down. Bottom line, LaRusso has been everything the Terps could have hoped for and more. Another player that has been vital to Maryland's success this year is Troy Schreffler Jr. Coming into the season, the Maryland faithful expected a big jump from the junior outfielder, and boy, did he take that jump. In 2021, Schreffler impressed by hitting at a 275 clip, but this year, he's on a whole nother level, hitting 348 so far, which leads the team and is top 15 in the Big Ten. Schreffler has also increased his on-base percentage by nearly 80 points, and his power has skyrocketed as well. Before this season, Schreffler had eight career extra base hits, but this season alone, he has 18. And even while improving significantly at the plate, Schreffler has looked unbelievable out in right field, as he's made diving catches look routine. Without Schreffler, it's safe to say this Maryland team would not be the same. And finally, we've got to talk about the Terps' most consistent pitcher this season, Jason Savicool. Savicool has absolutely shined on the mound so far in 2022. The sophomore righty has now made 10 starts, going at least seven innings in nine of those starts. Through 72 innings of work, Savicool has pitched to a 2.63 ERA, and he's picked up a conference leading 85 strikeouts while holding opposing hitters to a batting average of just 190. While Nick Dean and Ryan Ramsey have also been fantastic on the bump this season, Savvy Sundays are a time for Rob Vaughn to save his bullpen arms and let Savicle do his thing, and it's been working all season long. Even early in his career, it's clear that Savicle has established himself as one of the best pitchers in the Big Ten. The Dirty Terps have gotten major contributions from many players on the roster this season, but the performances of LaRusso, Schreffler, and Savicle have boosted Maryland's hopes for a trip to Omaha. And guys, I could have put so many players on that list just now, including Bobby Smarzak, who's had a bunch of clutch moments in recent weeks for Maryland. Mm -hmm. Smarzlak and a bunch of other players on that roster are fantastic, but those three specifically that you mentioned are on fire currently. You know, I'm really intrigued to see where Rob Vaughn's squad really takes this. I mean, they're already at 30 wins. It's been their best season in the past, whoever knows how many years, four or five, and I'll be excited to see where they take this in the Big Ten tournament. Thanks, Nathan. You can catch the 23rd ranked Terps back in action today at 6.30 as they host Navy. I'll have that coverage from the Bob. Now don't go anywhere because when we come back, we'll be joined in studio by Maryland baseball standout slugger Maxwell Costas. And we'll bring in our men's basketball beat writers to see how Kevin Willard's roster is shaping up for next season. And ahead, we'll have an NFL draft preview and crown our top five plays of the week. All that and much more next. back and change it all. I would. I, would. I think I'm going to miss you the most. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Or maybe it's just the little moments. I could go back and change I could go back and change it all. I could go back. I would. But I can't. Welcome back to the Left Bench TV, where we have quite the treat for you. That's right. It's Maryland baseball first baseman Maxwell Costas joining us live in studio. Max, thanks so much for being here. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here, y'all. And we just have a couple questions for you before we have some fun later on. Does that sound good to you? Sounds good. all good to me, man. All right, so this is your fourth year, obviously, in College Park. But this is the first time your team has won more than 30 games, and you still have a lot more to go. So what's different about this team this year? I think... Um, you know, when I think about my freshman year, right, that freshman year team had a lot of, like, you know, seniors on the team that, you know, Coach Vaughn would probably say that that was the year where not necessarily, like, the talent of the team got better, but more so, like, the culture of the team got better, right? Like, the culture of, like, holding ourselves accountable without needing the coaches to yell at us, you know, the culture of, like, going in to get your extra work and extra work becoming, like, required instead of, like, you know, if you want to, if you don't want to type of stuff, right? And I think that mentality has kind of carried 
through to my sophomore year, even though like the season got sh cut short. You know, we ended that season we were 12 and five before that season got cut short. Then last year, you know, making it to a regional where, you know, we just came up short of being able to advance to the Super, right? So now I feel like, you know, aside from the talent we might have on the team, you know, we have, you know, the, the three-headed monster of uh, Dean, Ramsey, and Savvy, you know, and, you know, we, I think we have the most, one of the most complete lineups in the Big Ten, you know, maybe even the country, right? I think it's more so than talent. Right now, it's culture and mentality that's added to that talent now that has made us, like, you know, such like a powerhouse team now. Yeah, and this weekend, it was a roller coaster with an 18-run loss on Friday followed by two wins on Saturday. So I know Coach Vaughn always preaches E plus R equals O, and then event plus response equals outcome. So how'd you guys show that in Illinois? You know, I, games like that happen sometimes. Games like that will happen to anybody, right? You know, I remember when we were in the, um, the post-game huddle, that, in fact, that's the first thing he said to us, right? Like, you know, the only way that this, you know, affects whatever we're trying to do this season, how far we go, what we want to go this season, right? Does this game carry over into tomorrow where, you know, now we have to come out, you know, we, we're at the field for almost 11, 12 hours that Saturday, like, you know, can we come out and keep the same mentality that we've always had, you know, whether, you know, when we went down to Baylor, you know, for the first series of the year, you know, we were in front of all their fans, we said, you know, we're just going to come down here and take care of business, right? After a loss like that, you know, we were, um, I think we were on the Big Ten Network, everything, you know, everybody was hyping up the series, right? We lose by 18 runs. Yeah. Right, you know, and so now I bet you it, we sitting there thinking, oh, man, people must think, oh, Maryland's, like, you know, Maryland's a fluke, Maryland's this, and that. Like, we weren't really worried about that, to be honest. Like, we said, tomorrow we're going to come out, we're going to do what we always do, and wherever the fa cards fall, they might fall, right? And luckily, those cards fell in favor for us. You know, we were able to, you know, come back, win a series in a row, which Illinois has been playing amazingly recently, you know, right? And so to go to Illinois and take a series from them, especially with a hyped up series like it was, you know, that's a really big for us. And even more so, it shows that, you know, even when we get punched, you know, we have the ability to come back. We're a tough team, like, you know, and that's really what it takes to, you know, make noise, not even the Big Ten tournament, but in the NCAA tournament as well. Yeah, that's like the most important part, just being able to come back. And that's a great way to look at it. Now, Max, obviously you lead the team in home runs with 12 this season. Can you just describe that feeling, what it's like when you're just able to you know, rip one off the bat, especially at the bob? You know, um, it, it's kind of weird when you hit a home run, right? You, you think about in, in sports, like maybe like, you know, hitting a three or like, you know, scoring a touchdown, right? Like, to be honest, I, as someone who's played multiple sports, I still think hitting home runs is the best feeling in the world, right? Because you're kind of just jogging around the bases and, like, the, everybody's eyes is on you, right? Like, you're kind of like the star of the show now because you've just done something like, you know, if you ask me, hitting a baseball is the hardest thing to do in sports, right? So to do it to, do it to that extent is kind of like an amazing thing, right? So, you know, I, I you know, take every all 12 of them like I'm, I'm grateful for them and you know I celebrate them you know right because those very well could have been swing and misses I could be walking back to the bench you know what I'm saying so hitting a home run is like it's a weird feeling because it's like such like a such like a an elated feeling right like you you just want you, you you're rounding second right and you see the outfielders just looking up at the ball going on the stands and you're like huh I just did that you know what I'm saying so I would say it's the best feeling in sports. Well, I definitely have not had that feeling when I took <laughs> peewee ball. I, did, I, I could not hit a home run to save my life. I was more the bunting type of kid. But uh, anyways, now before we let you go, are you down to assign some superlatives to your team? Absolutely. Oh, All I'm right. so excited for All this. Right. So first we have, who is most likely to be late to practice? Hmm. I'm going to say... As a kid, as much as I hate to put him on the spot like this, our Friday night guy, Nick Dean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so the best person to be stranded on a deserted island with? Stevie Thomas. Stevie is a freshman on the team. He's, he's a catcher, and he's, he's honestly probably the smartest kid I think I've ever met in the world, right? And he's like, but he's like one of those smart people that's kind of like really chill about it. Like, you wouldn't know that he's that smart. Like, I remember there was one time, like, um, one of our, one of the speakers was broken, right? And we were, I was sitting there, I was like, dang, like, the speaker's broken, like, how are we gonna use this now? And he was, he took it, right? And he was like, 
Ah, give me like 10 minutes, right? And he, and he went to his room and he came back and he, he had completely like rerouted the circuitry in the speaker to fix it and stuff. And I, he, and I was like, I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, here. Like he, he didn't even think it was like that much of a big deal, right? So he's such like a, like a really just cool and just like peaceful like individual, right? And you know, if you see, if you ever come to, um, the home games, right? I usually like after we do like our, our pregame meeting on the outfield, like me and him always hug each other. And I don't know why we started that, but we kind of just did. And now it's just our thing we do before every game. So like, if I had to pick somebody, Stevie Thomas, easily. Okay, so now next question, kind of similar. Who on the team has the best bromance? <sighs> I'm gonna give that to to Chris Aline and uh, Matt Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> I, they. They're always together, always. I don't think I've ever seen one of them without the other one being there. Love that. Okay. All right, who has the best drip? <sighs> Troy Shreffler, <laughs> easily. Really? Oh, easily. Like if if we're talking like 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 on field, right? I mean, he's got the headband, the eye black. He's got three or four chains on. Right, he's got the wristband like I do. Like you know, he has different he has different color like leggings he wears with every jersey. Like he's just he's got it like easily. Okay. Not even a question. To me. Makes sense. And who other than yourself obviously has the best walk up song? <sighs> See, I'm biased. I'm biased for this one because I feel like I I like certain types of music, but oh, man, I think I'm gonna give it. I think I'm gonna give it to um, I'm gonna give it to Nick Larusso. What's his walk up? He he does a solo by Future. Okay. Right, and I feel like I feel like you know most people want to do like really like hype songs of their walk ups, mm -hmm. right? But that song is like really slow and like really like you know just like chill. But the vibe of the song is still gets you hyped up, right? So whenever he's hitting in front of me and and he, you know his walk up starts playing, I'm like, oh yeah, it's, it's go time now, right? <laughs> so definitely, I'll give it to Nick, uh, Nick Russo. All right, well, Max, thanks so much for being here, and best of luck in your series against Navy. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys for asking me to come. Of course. Now, Maryland softball continued its hot streak with a 2-1 series win over Minnesota this past weekend. After dropping the first game 13-1 to the Golden Gophers, the Terps' offense roared back for game two. Eight of the nine players in Maryland's lineup had at least one hit in the 6-1 win to tie up the series. Sunday's rubber match ended in the Terps' favor with a 4-3 win, sealing the series. Kylie Goff got Maryland on the board early with an RBI single, and the Terps pulled ahead courtesy of Katie Dustin's two RBI sacks fly in the top of the seventh. Maryland will travel to East Lansing this weekend for three games at Michigan State as the team looks to continue its best start in conference play since joining the Big Ten. Spring sports are still going strong, but one other team has closed out its regular season. Maryland tennis capped things off with an exclamation point on Sunday, taking down Penn State 4-1 in Happy Valley. Wins from doubles pair Selma Kadar and Mary Brumfield and then Menorca Miranda and Marta Perez-Moore earned the Terps the doubles point. At four singles, Brumfield's two-set win clinched the victory for the Terps, earning Katie Doherty's team a 17-win season, matching the program record set 34 years ago. The Terps will now look to make some noise in the postseason as they head to Iowa City for the Big Ten tournament. They'll open against the Indiana Hoosiers on Thursday. Now, even in the offseason, Maryland basketball never fails to make headlines. And even despite the recent mass exodus from the transfer portal, it's official. Brenda Fries is staying in College Park for quite a while. The two-time National Coach of the Year signed an extension with the university that will keep her here through the 2028-29 season. In her 20 years with the program, she's led the Terps to a national championship win, 19 winning seasons, 18 bids to the NCAA tournament, 10 Sweet 16s, 6 Elite 8s, and 3 Final Fours. Here's to at least another seven years of Coach Freeze in College Park. And even though the program lost five of its players to the transfer portal, including stars in Angel Reese and Ashley Owusu, Coach Freeze wasted no time getting to work with what she does best, recruiting. Hailing from Italy, 5'8 guard Elisa Pinzon is coming to College Park after four seasons with USF and was named the AAC's Most Improved Player in 2021 and earned all AAC's second team honors. Just one day later, Coach Freeze added two top 55 recruits to her incoming freshman class. 
Brianna McDaniel, a 5'10 guard and Chicago native, is ranked 42nd overall by ESPNW and is the top ranked senior from the state of Illinois. She joined by Gia Cook, a 5'9 guard who's staying home in Maryland to join Freeze's squad. Cook is a four-star recruit who plays at Bishop McNamara and averaged 15 points and four rebounds per game this season. The fourth and final addition is Ivy League Player of the Year, Abby Myers. Myers has played her last three seasons at Princeton, where her average of 18 points and six rebounds per game earned her an AP honorable mention. And Brenda Fries isn't the only Maryland basketball coach making moves lately. It's been a little over a month since Kevin Willard took over as the new skipper for the men's basketball team, but he's already gotten to work. And who better to break down the latest news from the recruiting cycle than TLB's Wright brothers, Logan Hill and Noah Ferguson. Thanks for coming in, guys. Thanks for having us. All right, so there's been a lot of talk about who Willard might bring in to fill in some of these scholarship spots, whether it's from transfers or recruits. So, so far he's only signed Maryland native and IMG product, Noah Bachelor. So what do we know about him? Um, he's an athletic wing, and that's a good place to start when you have a lot of holes to fill. And being a Maryland native, he's going to drum up the coming home, the, all that, and it's really good for your first recruit to be that kind of player, especially when the talk around the Maryland basketball program had been not being able to get homegrown products. So to start with one, it's a good place. Yeah, I mean, and first he's got a sick name, so, uh, <laughs> but, but second of all, as, as Logan said, he's, uh, I mean, he's, he's an athletic wing and he brings a lot of excitement to this program as someone that's from Maryland, as Willard tries to get into that DMV recruiting that, that uh, Terps fans have missed out on for, for a little while now. Now, I guess the really only question there is, can he wear a pastel as nice as you guys have today? Oh, but stop. Uh, now, Maryland has been in the mix for a number of big names, a couple of big names in the transfer portal, most notably Detroit Mercy's Antoine Davis, the number three scorer in college basketball last season. Now, what are the odds that Willard's able to land someone like that? I don't know necessarily what the odds are, but if you're a fan of Maryland basketball, if you're someone that follows the program, you just have to be happy that Maryland is in the running for these guys because so often throughout the last couple of years, we didn't see that. And we're starting to see that. Like, Sky Clark didn't commit to Maryland, but Maryland made his top five. So just to start there, um, more names, more guys interested in the program. It's going to build up the program on its own, and it's also going to bring in some bigger names. And, and that's a good thing for Kevin Willard, too. It, it, it speaks to his name and notoriety, as well as the program's name, as he talked about in his introductory press conference that Maryland was a top 10 job in the country. So uh, that, I think that kind of speaks to the, the pedigree that Maryland is trying to get back to, that some of these big name recruits, even in a, in a year where it could be a rebuild year next year, people are already trying to transfer into the program. Yeah, exactly. And since Jay Wright stepped down at Villanova, there's been a lot of buzz about Willard getting a possible recruit here at home. So it's been reported that 2022 Wildcat commit Cam Whitmore is weighing his options after Wright's recruitment. So do you guys think that Maryland could swoop in? Uh, yeah, well, the latest I've heard is that there hasn't been so much talk from his camp necessarily, but he is, he went to Spalding, which is not far from here, it's about 40 minutes, and he's number 21 in the nation according to ESPN, so if he does open back up his recruitment, Maryland was in his top 10, and that gets back to what we're talking about of just being in the running. So he's another athletic wing, and if he wants to be a star in his home state, he could come back to Maryland and do just that, and with Jay Wright stepping down, who knows what's next for Villanova, so just again, to even be in contention for some of these big names is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Jay Wright stepping down is a huge thing for Maryland men's basketball because Jay Wright has been a juggernaut in the DMV area for in terms of recruiting. And, and so Maryland's missed out on a lot of those recruits that have gone over to Villanova. So to, to have him step down, maybe Willard can step up as that guy who's really run the recruiting game in the DMV area for a long time. And, and Cam Whitmore is a, is a good litmus test there. And I know that he's obviously going to get some help from his assistant coaches that he has hired now as well that do have DMV roots. So we'll definitely look forward to that, guys. Thanks, as always. It's always a pleasure having you here in studio to break it all down with us. So uh, thanks for coming on again, as always. Yeah, awesome. thanks for having us. And thanks, it's friend. a shame there's no game today. Uh, <laughs> you'll see about that because we haven't talked women's soccer in quite a while, but I met up with two alums for a friendly penalty kick competition. And we've got a preview of which Terps should be on your NFL draft watch list. Stay tuned. Black truck. Hey, Christina from accounting. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, I used to date a girl named Christina. Oh, really? Yeah, 
and then she dumped me for my best friend. You want to see some photos of them that I took? I don't. I thought we talked about this, buddy. Buzz and overshared again? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna call a car. That's a smart idea. So yeah, I know. That's why I did it. Hey, you're gonna get back to the top of the mountain. Does that mean I'm gonna get back with Christina? No. Oh. No, no. Now this Thursday marks the biggest week of the offseason for football fans, the NFL Draft. And we've got quite a few Terps hoping to go pro, so our Katie Marr is here to break down who's got the best shot of making their dreams come true. Katie? Yeah, guys, we had seven Maryland football players participate at this year's Pro Day in the Jones Hill House, and they all stand a chance of seeing their name on the TV or getting signed after the draft. And we're going to start off with the two names everyone should be on the lookout for, Safety Nick Cross and tight end Chico Conquo, who both received invites to the Combine and put up insane numbers, specifically in the 40-yard dash. Cross led all of the safeties in the event with a time of 4.34 seconds. He's a player that's been known for his burst when running and physicality when tackling ball carriers. He knows how to identify threats in zone coverage and can follow receivers' routes easily with that speed he's got beneath him. Cross upped his stock of the 2021 season, leading the Terps with two forced fumbles, three interception, and was second on the team with 44 forced tackles. His three sacks were also the most of any defensive backs in College Park. Sports Illustrated has the 6'1 DeMatha grad as the sixth best safety prospect in this draft class. And some places he could end up that need to address their safety needs, AFC champs Cincinnati, the Bills, the Jets, and the Pats. But one local team that's been in dire need of a true safety, the Washington Commanders. So who knows, this Maryland native could be staying right here in the DMV with his former teammate at DeMatha, Chase Young, to help out the secondary. Here's Cross on what a team would be gaining by adding him to its roster. I feel like I bring anything you want. Um, defense, I can play, play anywhere on the, on the field. Um, special teams, I can play all four special teams. And you know, at the end of the day, I'll be, I'll be great in the community, someone who you know, is a great ambassador for the organization. Now to the fastest tight end at the Combine, Chig Okonkwo. Okonkwo was one of Talia Tungabailoa's most consistent targets in 2021, collecting 52 receptions for 447 yards and five touchdowns. The six foot three tight end turned heads at the Combine, leading the tight ends in the 40 yard dash with a time of 4.52 seconds. The good news for Okonkwo is that PFF has him ranked as the eighth best tight end in this draft class. The only thing working against him, not a lot of teams really need to draft a tight end this year, but that's no reason to worry, because on Maryland's Pro Day, Okonkwo told press he's had in-depth conversations with the Giants, Titans, Saints, here's him visiting their facility in New Orleans, dunking one in, the Browns, and others, including the Ravens. That caught the eye of Lamar Jackson on Twitter, who responded saying Chig and Mark Andrews would be an awesome duo in Baltimore. Now, one player that didn't get an invite to the Combine, but proved on Pro Day that maybe he should have, Sam Okuyanu. The defensive lineman put up numbers that would have led his respective position in four events at the Combine. He ran a 4.75 40-yard dash, put up 31 reps on the bench, had a 35.5-inch vertical jump, and would have tied for first with a 10-foot, 3-inch broad jump. Running back Tayon Fleet Davis also wasn't invited to the Combine, but is still declared for the draft. He led the Terps on the ground in 2021 with 128 carries for 721 rushing yards, running in eight touchdowns too. And Fleet Davis is a dual threat. He had the third highest receptions on the team in 2021, adding 32 for 305 receiving yards and one score to his resume. He knocked a 35-inch vertical jump on Pro Day, and if he isn't drafted, stands a great chance at still being signed afterwards, just like running back Javon Leak back in 2020. And two more names to look out for are defensive back Jordan Mosley and kicker Joseph Petrino. Mosley ended the season with a team-high 83 tackles, broke up eight passes, and forced one fumble, earning him a Big Ten honorable mention nod. Petrino has been Maryland's primary kicker for four years. He's notched a career-long 51-yarder in those four years and made a 55-yarder at Pro Day. In those four years at College Park, he's made 129 of 139 extra point attempts and 31 of 44 field goal attempts. And when you include D-lineman Latez Rogers, that's seven Terps that we could end up making our Pro Terp one day. And we'll just have to wait and see how it all plays out this week. And guys, another name to look out for is former Maryland lacrosse to Waraton winner Jared Bernhardt. As incredible as he is on the lacrosse field, it's always been his dream to play for pro football. Won the D2 National Championship with Ferris State as a QB this year, and now he's being viewed as a wide receiver or kick returner prospect for the NFL.
prime Bill Belichick prospect, if yeah. you ask me. I literally, he's absolutely amazing, and I wouldn't be surprised if I saw any of those names up on that draft watch list. Yep. You know, I'm a New York Giants fan, and I mean, we need almost every position at this point. So, I mean, I'm more than happy to take someone that I've been used to covering for the past two years. So that'd be pretty cool. But thank Could you, Could end Katie. up there. Never know. Yeah. Now, Burton Hart, Fleet Davis, Oconquo. Those are all names that have graced our top five plays plenty of times over the years. And we've got five new ones from this past weekend to add to that list. So, Stephen, let's kick things off on our top five plays. Starting things off at number five, it's Katie Dustin hitting a sack fly to deep right field to bring in two runs, giving Maryland the 4-3 lead at the top of the seventh. Now we're going to watch that slide home one more time. She's safe! And at number four, Kyle Long passes it to Anthony DeMeo, who looks for his open man and Eric Molliver, sneaking it in for the 13-4 lead in the third quarter. That Hopkins goalie barely saw it coming. Awesome stuff from the Atlanta native. Now Jason Savicool might be known for his Sundays, but our number three play is from Savvy Saturday. Savicool gets a huge strikeout to cap off the eighth inning just when his team needed it most, keeping the Terps on top six to four. Savvy was understandably fired up. Our number two play is unassisted Hannah Lubecker doing the absolute most, diving on her side to add an extra goal to the board. The junior attack notched three points en route to the Turks' Big Ten championship win. And the moment you've been waiting for, it's another unassisted diving goal for our top play of the week. Anthony DeMeo falls to his side to worsen the blow against Hopkins even more. The fifth year midfielder had himself a day notching four points. Congrats to Anthony on being our top play of the week. It was a huge weekend for Maryland women's lacrosse, so we couldn't just choose one Terp for our Terp of the week. We had to go with two. Attacker Libby May and goalie Emily Sterling, who both hit career highs on Saturday. Let's first talk about May. She netted a career high seven goals. You heard that right, seven. En route to secure her team's conference title. What a day for the junior. Now from offense. To the defense, Sterling was a beast in the net, snagging a career-high 16 saves and only allowing nine goals. Congrats, Libby and Emily, on being our Terps of the Week, and we can't wait to see what you both bring in the postseason. Now, our pro Terp for this week is a face that has recently made a resurfacing in the USFL. Houston Gamblers defender William Likely III hails from Maryland football's 2016 squad and had himself a game last week. Likely pulled off a massive interception late in the first half against the Michigan Panthers in front of his father, who has been by his side since his career-ending ACL tear in 2016. The ball Likely picked off was handed to his father, a small gesture that clearly meant the world to his father. Congrats, Will, on being named our Pro Turf of the Week. Now soccer season may be over for now, but Steven, I heard you recently hung out with some alums for some friendly competition. Yeah, Alana, I challenged a couple of former Maryland women's soccer players to a penalty competition. Let's just say things got messy. I'm Steven Mailing outside of the Vart City team house here at the University of Maryland, and alongside me are two former Maryland women's soccer players, Lauren Sepchek and Taylor Whitmer. And today we're gonna play a little game we like to call PK or Pie. So all of us are each gonna take five penalty shots with I'll be saving theirs, and one of them will be saving mine. And the loser at the end, they get pied. So, y'all ready to play? Woo! Yeah, let's go. I'll take it. That was like... 
bad hit, but I'll take that. We're not gonna pie Taylor, we're gonna pie Steve. No, or I mean, he's pieing me because I think he's like, I'm gonna pie you. He's gonna pie me, Lauren's gonna sneak up with her quick feet and go, Whoa. Okay, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I have out. to go get one ready then. Yeah, or you say, I, I wanna do it to Taylor, sneak okay. him. Okay. Oh, well, I'll get two. One. Okay. That's get what's gonna happen. <laughs> All right, so we have the final results from this game. Lauren and I tied at three piece. Yep. And Taylor unfortunately only had two goals Ooh, with me second. and in goals. So, Taylor, can you talk a little bit about your performance today? You know, bad day, whatever. Washed up a little bit, but I'll get you next time. Lauren, how about you? You tied me. So how do you feel? Yeah, I thought I was going to do better, but I guess I won't take the L today. <laughs> it's true. All right, Taylor. You ready? You're getting you bad. Oh! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Be sure to keep up with Maryland women's soccer next season Woo! as they make their run for the Big Ted Tourney. Yeah. Keep the desserts on the plate. <laughs> okay, well, Steven, I'm just upset that I did not get an invite to that. Uh, you shouldn't be, honestly, because I think I was hearing whipped cream for the next three hours, and I <laughs> reeked of it, so I really needed a shower after that. So. Well, that does it for this edition of The Left Bench, but before we sign off, I just want to say tonight is Steven's last night at the desk here, and on behalf of all of The Left Bench, we want to give a huge thank you to you for all your time and dedication and everything that you've put into the show. Thank I appreciate you. appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Of course. All right, so be sure to keep up with all of our coverage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Left Bench. We'll see you back here next week on The Left Bench in Focus, where we go all in on the newly crowned Big Ten champion, Maryland women's lacrosse team.